So the 2020 Tokyo Olympics are over, and if you're like a lot of other people out there, myself included, you're feeling a bit inspired, and you really wanna know what it takes to become an Olympic archer. So I'm gonna take you through my Olympic journey, starting from when I was six years old, shooting arrows in my backyard, all the way up through uh, making an Olympic team and becoming an Olympian, and ultimately winning a couple of medals. So I'm just looking to open up a discussion on here as I'm talking to you, as well as down in the comments section, about what it takes to become an Olympian, and specifically, how to become an Olympian in the sport of archery. Yeah, like I said, I've had lots of comments and lots of questions asking me if it was too early or too late or how do you get started, you know, how difficult it is, things like that. And because I grew up shooting archery at a very young age and continued shooting throughout my young adult life, into my adult life, and ultimately becoming an Olympian, I figured I could share my journey. And that way you can understand a little bit more as to what it actually takes to become one and what you can look forward to once you get there. So if you're new here, my name is Jake Kaminsky. I represent the United States of America, and I have shot in two Olympic games, in the 2012 Olympics in London, where I brought home a team silver medal with Brady Ellison and Jacob Wookie. And then I also shot in 2016 in Rio with Brady Ellison and Zach Garrett, and we took home another team silver medal. This was a lifelong journey and a lifelong dream come true to be able to achieve those successes. And I'm really excited to share with you my journey and my story so you can kind of understand more as to how do you ultimately become what is an Olympian and how do you become those people that you saw shooting on TV and you saw representing their countries that they're from, representing their families, representing themselves on a world stage at the highest level, at the pinnacle of sports. Also, I'm really working on this channel to make a really good resource for all types of archery. I am, of course, biased towards Olympic style recurve. I've been playing with bare bow some. I have a traditional bow on the way. I shoot compound as well. I haven't done enough compound content on this channel, but of course I will in the future. And you know, as things evolve, I'll do more in different styles of archery and help share my knowledge and information for you to understand and help make you a better archer at home. So if you haven't yet, please do hit that subscription button and the notification bell. That way you're notified when I upload new content. I try to produce content fairly often, although recently I haven't been due to a move and you know, summer's coming to an end. So you spend some time with some family before we all head back into school. Well, not uh, me, but the kids. So. Uh, yeah, it's been a little slow this month, but I'm gonna get back into it and produce a whole lot more content for you guys to enjoy shortly. So, I got started in archery when I was five years old. I went to a camp that was a day camp, and we had archery that was shot right around uh, lunchtime. It was at the bottom of the hill of the area that the camp was in, and I was in a cabin at the very top of the hill, and every time the uh, lunch bell rang or whatever, the next session bell rang, I would sprint from the top of the hill down to the bottom, hoping to be able to shoot archery. Ultimately, after being there for a couple of weeks, I never even actually got to shoot a shot. I stood there in line, and always was the last kid in line for whatever reason, because, you know, way up on top of the hill, it was frustrating as an individual. But I told my parents, hey, I really want to try archery. And we went to a local, I think it was a Kmart actually, and bought my very first bow. It was a bare compound that was, uh, you know, pretty basic, just comes off the shelf and you get some arrows. And we got some hay bales at a farm nearby, put up a paper target, and I started shooting and never really stopped. Once I got that bow, that was on my sixth birthday, that was when I shot my very first arrow, and I was hooked from the beginning. My brother Matt was much older at the time than me and was like, all right, I'm going to show you how to do this and missed a whole bunch of arrows his first few shots and said, all right, you give it a try. And I specifically remember this because how could you not forget this? My very first shot was at 20 yards, which is twice the distance you would ever logically and safely start a six-year-old shooting. You know, they would normally start at least at 10 yards. And my very first arrow was an inside out X. I, I'm not lying. I'm not even joking. And yes, the next hundred arrows after that, of course, missed the target. But since that first arrow, I've been hooked. 
and I've been doing nothing but shooting archery. I've done a few other sports and a few other activities and had some other focuses, but primarily archery was my bread and butter. And since I was so interested and excited about shooting archery, we found a local program that was just down the street from us, a Junior Olympic Archery Development Program through USA Archery. And I started shooting there, worked my way up, and got through all the ranks, both indoors and outdoors, and just really, really never even stopped shooting archery. I did start with compound. This is not always common, but sometimes it does happen where a lot of people will start with a compound. And I shot compound for over six years and went through various different bows and different styles, shooting fingers and then to shooting releases with a scope and back tension releases and the whole nine yards. And ultimately, I really stopped shooting compound because I developed something called target panic. Target panic is a weird little thing that your brain does and freaks you out and really anticipates shooting the shot. And it's a little difficult to deal with. Ultimately, it just really l raises the level of anxiety while you're at full draw. There are methods on how to deal with that, and eventually I'm going to cover that on this channel. But what's important is it got so unfun, you know, really not fun at all for me to shoot archery because of the level of anxiety I had. I couldn't aim in the middle. I couldn't shoot well anymore. And I looked on the walls, and there was always bows hanging on the walls for new archers to shoot. They had a higher mid-range uh, bow at the time on the wall, and I picked it up, put a clicker on it, put my sight on it, stabilizers from my compound, the whole nine, even shot the arrows that I was shooting out of my compound and started shooting recurve and it instantly fell in love with this. I was 12 years old at the time and I picked up the recurve a few months before Empire State Game tryouts. So Empire State Games is kind of like a little mini Olympic Games and it's a multi-sports event and it happens throughout the entire state of New York and different regions compete uh, as a team and individually against each other and you can win medals just like in the Olympics But since then I was basically hooked on the sport of recurve archery because it was simple It was easy and I really loved shooting tens I loved aiming in the middle shooting with my fingers was fun and it was really enjoyable that clicker basically eliminated the target panic from distracting me from the fun of archery at that time, I had started to get really good in baseball. I was pitching in a local like farm uh, club, basically, uh, you know, a farm development team. That means like grassroots training in the baseball world. That's what a farm team is. And basically, you know, I was starting to try out for the state team and things like that at the same time that I started winning nationals in archery shooting recurve. And so both of them were competing for my time. I needed to practice archery and I needed to practice baseball. One I was going to nationals with and the others I was going to state with. And you know, you hear all those stories about pros or pro wannabes in uh, baseball getting up and then, you know, they never really even make it and they hurt themselves. And you know, you hear all those stories all the time. So I said, all right, I'm going to pick archery. And I dropped baseball and really only focused on archery. It got to the point of where I was traveling around the country, shooting all of the USA archery uh, ranking events to try to make the USAT team or actually the junior USAT team at that time. Junior being I was under 18 years old and I ended up making a few junior USAT teams. I tried out for a junior world team, made that team, and that's when the national head coach of USA Archery, Kesick Lee, came up to me and said, hey, I want you on my team. I want you to go to the junior dream team program, which just had started at that time. He just moved here from Australia and started coaching uh, archers in the United States. And I said, hey, actually, I sent in an application to become a resident athlete there, and I'd rather just be an RA instead of going on the junior dream team. And he said, great, I'll keep an eye out for that, and hopefully I'll see you soon. So a few months later, I moved out to the Olympic Training Center in October of 2006. I had just turned 18 that year in August, and you know, it was like a whirlwind. You know, I, I moved from Western New York to Central Florida before for a year before going out to California and San Diego, Chula Vista, California, specifically for the Olympic Training Center. So it was kind of like a crazy change that my life went through in a very short period of time. And I really was dedicated to the sport of archery and really trying to get better at it to make the Olympic team as my ultimate end goal. Prior to moving out to the Olympic Training Center, I had never worked out a day in my life. Well, that's not necessarily true. I did try to train um, in the gym or in the weight room along with, you know, the, the football players and the baseball players and, and the wrestlers and things like that after school because it was available. 
but it really it wasn't wasn't really working out. It was kind of just a bunch of planks and some stabilizing stuff. I really didn't work out a whole lot because I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. There was not the internet that there is now and how to help guide you through a whole lot of things and safety and all that. You know, it was, it was really not exactly working out in my opinion. So I hadn't really shot uh, a whole lot either. You know, for me, I could barely shoot maybe 200, 250 arrows in a day. Um, you know, our real goal, our meaning the club that I belong to, that produced a fair amount of high level shooters. The goal was try to shoot the double the amount of arrows that you would normally shoot at a tournament. And that was really the whole goal of trying to be able to do that. There was no methodology. There was no training, like what training can be. There was no deliberate focus. There was no mental training. There was really nothing other than just shooting. And I had no real technique, no real form. You know, my style of shooting was literally pull back the bow, aim, meaning look at the middle. I didn't even have a sight pin. I just had an open ring. And I just looked at the middle, I pulled back the bow, and I waited. And that was it, literally. Pull the bow back, look at the middle, wait. When the clicker clicks, let go of the string. That was my method. I had no technique, no process, no mental process, no nothing. Just, I'm going to win, pull back the bow, wait, click, okay, shoot. Literally, that was it. And so it was a real challenge for me to then move out to the Olympic Training Center where you wake up at 6.30 to be on, well, 6.15 to be on the track at 6.30 run for 45 minutes after doing some warm-ups, immediately go to breakfast, shower quickly, get back down to the archery range by 8.30, shoot from 8.30 to 11.30, break for an hour for lunch, back down at 1.30 on the range, shoot from 1.30 to 4.30, run up to the weight room, lift weights for an hour, three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, sometimes two hours, and then get some dinner, crash into bed, and do it all over again six days a week and it was brutal i will tell you it was really a challenge for me to see what it actually took to be a serious athlete not an archer but an athlete there's a difference between the two in my opinion and taking yourself seriously training for the sport of archery to become an athlete as opposed to just shooting archery and practicing archery there's a definitive difference of the two i was definitely practicing before I went out to the Olympic Training Center and I trained at the moment I went out to the Olympic Training Center. There is a big difference there. You don't always have to train in order to be successful. If you have a lot of talent and some really natural born uh, things that are on your side and some talents that you've uh, developed through other sports, like for example, I believe that playing baseball and specifically being the pitcher trained me to be in control, but also it helped develop my hand-eye coordination and archery helped develop my hand-eye coordination. So both of those sports kind of worked hand in hand and allowed me to be pretty proficient at both. Excuse the excessive sweating. It, I am in Florida and the heat index is well over 100 degrees today. So I'm doing my best here to uh, shield the camera from the sun so it continues to record. And uh, you know, I can still be out here sharing my experience with you. So once I got out to the Olympic Training Center, it was a shock. My entire form got destroyed. I mean, I, not, I didn't even have technique before, so it didn't even count, really. My form looked good. I had good alignment. I had basic T form. You know, some other things like that. Not even push-pull. There was, there was no technique. It was just literally, like I said, draw back and wait. Um, so the form got changed. All my equipment got changed. Um, everything. The only thing that didn't change, basically, within the first month was my riser and my sight bar. My sight pin, my finger tab, my arrows, my stabilizers, my string, my quiver, uh, my arm guard, <laughs> my finger sling. Everything else had changed. It's quite a shock. And I struggled for years. I didn't shoot very well for quite a long time. And I really started kind of getting wind into my sails late into 2009 season. So that's three years after I moved out to the Olympic Training Center into the uh, you know earlier stages of the 2010 year. So it took me three years to really get back to where I was when I first moved out to the Olympic Training Center. And it really ultimately ended up hampering my development long term because I had no foundation. It took so long for it to reset, to start back over from literally zero 
because I had not had any technique, I had not had any purpose, and I had not had any sort of mental process or program or any thought process that I really even went through while shooting. And so it really was just um, a detriment to my development long term. I also didn't know anything about equipment. I didn't know how to tune a bow. I didn't know how to align a bow. I didn't know how to do anything other than uh, draw some lines on my arrows and flesh some spin wings. That's really all I could do. And um, it was, it was a, a challenge. It was a struggle. And it was difficult. But because I came through and I've learned a lot that I have learned and gone through the, the process of going through, you know, young development stages into advanced development stages and then getting on the national team and traveling the world and doing the whole nine yards of shooting archery, you know, I can share with you a bit more in depth insights into what really should be focused on more in the beginning stages. So let me finish my quick development story or it's not very quick, but I'll finish it really quick to getting to uh, London and then I'll, you know, help you out as much as I possibly can. So yeah, I started shooting better in 2009, 2010, got picked up by some sponsors, starting getting more uh, comfortable with equipment, setting it up, tuning it, and you know, just really trying to maximize every single tiny little resource I had, not leaving any stone unturned, and maximizing as much as I could. Talking to nutritionists, talking to um, sports psychologists, talking to the physiotherapists, going to uh, sports medicine for recovery, talking to my coach, Coach Lee, creating an entire training plan using a scientific method called periodization, and really literally leaving no, stern, no stone unturned, talking to every expert that I could ever talk to within the sport of archery, people who designed equipment, you know, people who had won Olympics in the past, really just data gathering as much as I could and hoarding it all and just really internalizing it to try to use it to my advantage. And it ultimately, it paid off and, you know, I, I made an Olympic team and it was like a lifelong goal just achieved and just this excitement that you can't possibly explain, let alone trying to explain what it actually feels like to shoot on that Olympic stage. It's, uh, it's something you can't repeat and it's something that really makes you feel like you're alive. It's, it's something that I wish everybody could experience. Um, at least everybody that's watching this video because I care about you guys and that's why I'm here trying to share this information so you can learn quicker and be a better archer than I am and uh, do it in less time. That would be the best, uh, best case scenario and that's what I truly want for everybody um, because it's fun. You know, it's something to enjoy and it is definitely something you can hang your hat on and feel proud of for sure. So what I would recommend for those people who are asking, is it too late? Am I too old? Am I too young? What do I do? And how do I do it? Is yes, you can do it. Anybody can do it in my opinion. There is no limit with the exception of eyesight potentially degrading over time, but science is becoming amazing and we're starting to really reduce things like macular de degeneration. Speaking of that, I really wish I had sunglasses on while I'm out here in the full sunlight staring at this camera lens, but I don't wanna be rude and cover my eyes because I want you guys to you know, see what I'm feeling and thinking about a whole lot more. For those people that are in their early 30s or late 20s and something like that, and they're asking, hey, I'm so inspired now. What can I do? How can I do it? And is it too late? It is not too late. And the same question goes for how do I get started? Is it too early? You know, is it even possible? And of course, yes, it's absolutely possible. So both of those two things are related together because what really is required to be good at anything, and this doesn't even apply to just archery, this applies to everything in your life. In order to become an expert at something, the general rule of thumb that everybody talks about is 10,000 hours of deliberative practice or 10 years of experience. So those two things are generally pretty common and pretty well stated and probably overstated uh, because not many people really truly understand what that means. So if you've ever read a book um, called The Talent Code, which I will recommend uh, to check out if you're interested in that. I'll put a link in the description below in case you're interested in picking that book out. But it essentially is a book that has analyzed and really looked at why are people successful at anything they do. That could be a violinist, that could be a soccer player, that could be at any, you know, an executive, anything. And what it really comes down to is deliberative and hyper-focused practice or hyper-focused intention. So 
10,000 hours is not just 10,000 hours of flinging arrows in your backyard. I probably shot 10,000 hours worth of archery from six years to 18 years old, and I was definitely not an expert in the sport because it wasn't really hyper-focused. It wasn't, there was no direction to it. It was just, just go shoot archery because I loved it. And you can get good that way, but you're not an expert. An expert level knowledge and expertise and, uh, you know, just an entire encompassing understanding of anything is important to a high level of success. Excuse the scenery change. Even though I have the camera shielded from the sun, it overheated. And well, not overheated, but it was giving me a temperature warning saying, um, you know, please get out of the sun. So, and now the clouds are coming out. So <laughs> it is what it is that, you know, this is how this content goes. Anyway, now you get to see the back of the target, which nobody really sees while you're shooting. So the 10 year, 10,000 hour rule of thumb basically is something that just about everybody needs to go through in order to become an expert at what they're doing. That could be an expert, you know, meaning like a CEO of a company. That could be uh, being a high level archer, a high level athlete. That could be being, uh, you know, a really great teacher. And that's where tenure comes from and all that kind of stuff. Because the difference in just shooting archery and deliberately training for archery is the most important key. The way that I can explain the difference between just shooting and deliberative practice is pretty simple. Just shooting is simple. You go out whatever distance you want to shoot and you're just shooting arrows. You're not focused on anything, no form, no technique, no feeling, um, you know, not even paying attention to score really just shooting. Or even if you are scoring, you're just scoring for the sake of scoring with no real purpose or idea as to what to do with those scores. Deliberative practice, hyper-focused practice or training and actual focus on it is something entirely different. Focusing on what the shot process is. How do I feel? What am I thinking about? What am I doing as I'm drawing the bow back? What am I thinking as I'm drawing the bow back? Am I trying to control more or less of the shot? Am I trying to control more or less of a very specific part of the shot and then a different focus on a different part of the shot in a different area? Am I really trying to work on a mental program? Am I trying to get my release to do a certain thing? Am I working on my equipment to try to make it better? Ultimately, is there an ultimate goal, usually a stated goal, and am I trying to achieve that through a planned approach or is it just that I want that and that's where it ends you know if you want to become an Olympian or you're willing to work to become an Olympian those are two different things so this isn't to discourage you by any means please do not take it as this but you have to have a real intention to do something and you have to actually go for it to make it happen you can't just say you want it and not change anything else and just go shoot if you want to just go shoot just go shoot have some fun enjoy the sport of archery it's really enjoyable i love it um but there's a difference between just shooting and really working towards something so where i would start is and i always suggest this don't buy equipment that you shouldn't be buying buy more coaching the more coaching and the more knowledge you can surround yourself with and absorb either through deliberative uh, you know, coaching sessions and working with someone, or if you're trying to um, just listen in and watch other people coach other people, watch other people shoot, listen to, their, listen to what they're talking about, listen to what they're saying, listen to how they're working through the shot. If you have a, an expert level, like a, a club level pro basically, or your local pro in the shop that you're um, trying to shoot in and trying to get better at, Ask them, hey, how are you so good? Why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? How can you help me? Can I, you know, can you help me out a little bit too? Because in general, people that have the knowledge are actually willing to share it if you ask them. Uh, you know, I've not really run into many people in my career uh, in the sport of archery that have not been willing to share their, their insights or information or takes on pieces of equipment technique styles, mental approach processes, or anything like that. I like to live in the land of plenty as opposed to the land of scarcity. And so of course, I am really willing to share my information and that's why I'm sharing it for free here on YouTube for everybody. Because it's really important to me to get that information out so more people can understand it and more people can use it to their advantage. When I was growing up, you know, I was an arrogant teenager, just like just about every single one is. 
And, you know, I was like, nah, I don't you know, need to know that. I don't know who anybody is. I don't really care. I'm just going to be good. You know, I'm, I'm good. I'm a, I got it. I got it. It'll, I'll get better. Um, and I didn't really, honestly, the first time I ever met an Olympian, I was shooting on the same target butt at uh, Gold Cup as a junior, shooting with Vic Wonderly. And, uh, you know, I'm shooting. And he's like, hey, you're, you could be pretty good if you stick at this kid. I was just like, mm, yeah, whatever. And, you know, being a teenager. And my coach comes up and he goes, you know who that is? And yeah, I didn't shoot very well <laughs> the rest of the day after that. Um, you know, it's just one of those things. Like I just didn't pay attention to things. Maybe that was uh, partially due to some success that I had because I wasn't aware and didn't try too hard and didn't over try and get frustrated. That is potentially a possibility. But the amount of resources that we have at our fingertips today, both literally and figuratively, is impressive and the amount of information out there is immense and you know there's so many books on how to use a mental program and mental training because you hear a lot of people talk about how archery is 90 percent mental or something like that which i hate to break your bubble that's not necessarily true um, you know most people will say that in reference to a high level shooter which it is true but i gotta break it to you every single sport at the top it's all mental very little bit of it is physical Yes, running requires physical stuff, physical technique, physical strength, physical power, but ultimately what separates first from fourth is mental. It's very rarely physical. So, you know, like I said, I hate to break it to you, every sport at the highest level, what separates the cream of the crop from the rest is mental. So that definitely in itself is really, really important to really address and talk about. And it's one of those things that I wish absolutely I was able to have access to in the past was positive thinking, uh, positive affirmations, and overall just positive reframing. You know, I, I've talked to some of the people that I've worked with and coached over the years, and often, more often than not, most people always talk about the negative, always. If you ever go to any archery range, just walk down the line with anybody and listen, you'll see somebody that's got five tens and a seven. And you're going to be like, look at that seven I shot. They're always going to point out the bad. They're never going to point out the five tens. Par partly because, you know, you don't want to be arrogant. You don't want to brag. You don't want to be rude. But they always point out the seven. And now they're ingraining in their head sevens. You know, when people shoot a bad shot, they said, oh, I did this wrong. Great. Well, you're telling yourself, do that again because you're talking about the bad thing you're doing. Instead of the bad shot, talk to yourself about how to fix the good, bad shot and make it better. For example, I'm shooting, I'm pulling, 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 and as the clicker clicks, I collapse and I shoot a bad shot. Instead of saying to myself, stop collapsing, or I collapsed, what I would rather talk to myself about in a positive way is, I need to make sure this next shot is strong. I need to make sure I maintain my back tension through release and follow through. That is a positive reframing. The other is a negative acknowledgement. I'm not saying to reframe from saying and acknowledging the bad, but reframe it in a positive way so that way you have a positive imprint on yourself and you're bringing yourself up instead of ultimately crushing yourself down. You can be your, your, your worst self-critic and your worst critic in general, but there's a difference between being honest and being self-deprecating. There is a definite difference between the two. You cannot tear yourself down. You gotta be able to lift yourself up don't lie to yourself, just reframe things to make it a positive and try to help yourself get better. Instead of thinking about and looking at that seven that you shot when you shot a 57 with a seven, think about the five tens that you shot and really try to reinforce those and imprint those in your head because ultimately you're trying to shoot more tens, you're not trying to shoot more sevens. So at minimum, the number one thing that I can recommend to you is to try to be more positive, reframe things in a positive way, try to encourage yourself. You can. Be honest and recognize and acknowledge things that are happening, but what you do in the next few steps is the most critical and most important part. And many people fall on that one. So it doesn't matter what age you are, it doesn't matter how you're starting, try to be more positive, try to help yourself more, and instead of tearing yourself down, try to lift yourself up. The next thing I can suggest is try to find the best coach that you possibly can. You know, I started and had some really good people as a resource, you know, some people that were pretty decent compound shooters and pretty decent support people. And ultimately, you know, I really never even got any sort of coaching to the level that I 
got once I moved out to the training center. I had, like I said, no technique. I looked like the poster that was on the wall. It was the nine steps to the 10 ring back in the day when it was the NAA instead of USA Archery. And that's what I tried to mimic because that was a poster on the wall and it was easy to follow and very simple and very basic. Now everything else outside of that, there can be some complexities to uh, technique and things like that. But having somebody that has the knowledge and has the ability to coach you that is a high level coach a not necessarily literally a high level coach like as far as levels are concerned because that's not really uh, indicative of somebody's knowledge not always at least and you have to find somebody that can work with you where you are not somebody that's going to try to jam you into a box and try to make you do something a very particular way but somebody who can explain to you what's going on how the shot works what you should be focusing on what are the most important things and then go on from there. And then you can slowly tweak and adjust and make progress as you progress, and it really can be helpful. You know, I've talked about many times in these videos, always pay more for a coach and pay less for equipment. That's always the number one rule, in my opinion, is if you've got $500 burning a hole in your pocket, instead of buying that new riser, yes, some of the new ones are more expensive than that, but instead of buying the new riser, you can get a whole lot more points when you pay for some quality coaching. I'm talking quality coaching. Archers that have become coaches. That is really critical, really, really important, because especially if your goal is to become an Olympian, if you're working with a coach that hasn't shot very much themselves, they're going to have a hard time meeting you where you're at and trying to encourage you to get to that level that you're trying to get. There's a big difference between a club shooter and a world-class shooter. And the differences are quite easy to see if you just watch the two shoot, watch their mannerisms, watch the way they hold themselves, watch the way that they, you know, move through life. There is a very different, very big different thing about the two that is impossible to miss in my experience. But you have to be willing to look for it and you have to be willing to take notice and take notes on those things. Look at the best shooters in the world. Watch how they move, watch how they shoot, watch how they go through the process, how they pull the arrows out of their quiver, how they load them into the bow, and how they just go through the whole shot. It looks like a beautiful dance, a beautiful ritual. It is not just this chaotic explosion all over the place that's just, uh, you know, unruly. It's methodical, it is almost robotic, but it is so fluid and smooth. And that's ultimately what you want to try to become. You want to try to become somebody who looks like they know what they're doing, actually does know what they're doing, has their head on right, and they're really looking forward and trying to move to that goal and trying to set steps to get to that process. Now, now you may be thinking to yourself at this point, okay, great, that sounds excellent. So how do I do it? You gotta tell me how do I do it? It's impossible for me to sit here and talk to a camera and tell how everybody that is gonna watch this video, hopefully a lot of people, uh, how to do it. It's impossible. I can't tell you how to do it because each person is so specific and so individual. And that's why when I coach people, I never ever approach them from a cookie cutter mold that they must fit into. And I really want to work with them where they're at to enhance their level as they are getting better and better and better. And there are some things that need to be fixed that really need to happen but there are so many other important things that are completely missed that is gonna make a bigger difference than those other things that also need to change. And instead of doing everything all at once and confusing people, like I said, I just can't, I can't give you that answer without knowing a whole lot more. What I can give you is general guidelines. Gather information, try to learn more, pick up books, listen to audiobooks, watch videos, try to get better. Don't just hope it, don't just fling arrows, have a deliberative practice, a stated goal, write it on the mirror. Don't say, I want to be an Olympian because you're always going to want to be. You're, imp you're putting into your head, I want to be an Olympian. So you're wanting, you're wanting, you're wanting, you're wanting. What you want to write on your mirror is, I am an Olympian. That's part of the tattoo. That's why it's I am, period. I am is an affirmation that makes a big difference between I am, that means you have arrived, or I want to be. I want to be as great. Everybody wants to be something, but are you willing to put in the work to actually get there, or are you gonna to continue to want? With that all being said, I can tell you, 
I came from a small town in Western New York. I found, happened to find a, a club, uh, you know, a social structure to keep my interest while shooting. And I had the desire to get better and I practiced and practiced and practiced. Scraped to get by, to get to tournaments. There were many years in the later stages of my uh, junior shooting career that we couldn't afford, we being my family, couldn't afford to go to the tournaments. And, you know, my parents didn't go to very many of them because we couldn't afford it. It was really tough and things were ex expensive relatively at that time. And, you know, we were just doing very well as a family. So it was very, very difficult to get to these places. But, you know, I found somebody that could take me to the tournaments and I could room with them and, uh, you know, basically shared expenses for the entire year as I was uh, traveling around the country trying to make a USAT team and ultimately trying to become a resident athlete. And it was tough. It wasn't easy, you know, really just counting pennies at that point to try to just get to the next event. Once I went out to the Olympic Training Center, again, still struggled like, do I buy new shoes or do I go to the movies with all the rest of the team because they're going out to the movies? I need the shoes because I'm starting to see my toes hanging out the end, basically. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you have to uh, understand and know that even if you don't have the capital or the tools at your disposal, the Internet right now, if you're watching this video, chances are you have access to the Internet through one way, shape or form. And there's a lot of free information on the internet these days. There are a lot of free resources on how to think while you're shooting, you know, how to uh, uh, really work through mental processes to become a better anything, um, how to get better with technique, how to work on your equipment, how to source equipment. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there that didn't exist then, and it's free. A lot of it is free. I wish I had access to the amount of knowledge and information that is put out on the internet for people to absorb. It would have made a big difference uh, for me in my development, I believe, uh, but I did have that arrogance that a lot of teenagers do. And, you know, you, you get humbled once you become an adult, that's for sure, because you realize the world's a lot different than you think it is. But like I said, you know, in order to get there, Really all it takes is dedication, hard work, and a willingness to learn. Those are the things that are really, really important to get there. Now, what do all Olympians have in common that I really believe is true? I think, you know, you definitely have somebody that has a strong belief in their ability or their, their self eventually, maybe not right away because, you know, you're still amassing knowledge, you're still working on technique, you're working on stuff, and you haven't achieved much yet. But having that steadfast, true belief that you will eventually, you're going to, you know, you, I am, you're acting as if you already have and trying to let all the puzzle pieces fall in place. That's definitely important. A willingness to work hard, really, really hard, outwork your opponents, outwork your teammates, and really just keep pushing. Those two things absolutely are important and a hunger to compete. That is also important too. And I believe that if you're not a competitive person and you're not comfortable with competing, it might be a little difficult for you to get comfortable with the sport of archery because it is a direct competition. Your scores and how you're doing are there. You can't argue them. You can't say, oh, the judge was unfair and gave me uh, whatever the scores that gymnastics get versus I shot the arrow and it went in the 10 or it didn't go in the 10. You know, there's not really any way to argue that at all. So definitely being confident in your abilities, even if it's in the future, willing to work hard and really excited about competition. Those definitely are important. There are a few other things that I believe, uh, you know, really play into being a successful athlete in general. Uh, but I believe that we are really fast approaching on a world scale, a time where Archers are going to be less and less from the backyard and are going to be more and more athletes. And, and you know, really trying to approach it from that standpoint, trying to be serious about it and take things seriously is important. To really try to dedicate yourself to get there is what's important. The Olympics is not something easy to achieve. 
Many, many, many people try, only a few do, and those that do are the ones that work the hardest. So really genuinely taking an honest look at what you can do, what you wanna do, and what your abilities are, and push forward. I've seen many para people make able-bodied Olympic teams, and I've also seen many people come from small towns and humble beginnings become athletes as well and make it on the biggest skate stage and have a whole lot of fun and see a whole lot of stuff throughout their entire journey. You wanna be an Olympian, I hope you truly do. And if you do, start talking about being one rather than wanting to be one. Do that internally. Externally, that would be a little funny if you were six years old or 12 years old or 35 years old. If you haven't yet become an Olympian, talking about being one would be a little funny but at least reframe the stuff that you're talking about to try to become one and believe that you are and believe that you can be and not always wanting. That is definitely a very, very important tool to have in your toolbox to be able to work towards your journey on becoming an Olympian.